So this is the beginning of the lecture for chapter 21, electric charge and electric fields. And we're going to be specifically focused here on what we call point charges, where the charge is small enough that the shape of the charge doesn't actually have an effect on the electric field. In chapter 22, we'll start talking about electric fields due to larger structures where the shape of the object or the distribution of the charge of the object makes a difference on the electric field that is created by it. So I'm going to start with a little bit of basics here to make sure we're all on the same page. And we're going to talk a little bit about the structure of an atom. So we know that an atom has protons, and protons are positively charged in the nucleus. And then the electrons are on the outside. And we tend to imagine them in orbits, or what we call orbitals. But that's not really what's going on, but that's a little bit of outside of the scope of this particular course. So using the orbit or orbital model were, uh, is enough because we, all we need to understand is that there's positive charge at the center and that there's negative charge on the outside. Now right now I have it set up so there's one positive charge and one negative charge. So the positive and negative balance each other out and we have what's called a neutral atom. If I take the negative charge or electron away, we end up with a positive charge, and we have what's called an ion, where it's unbalanced. If I add two electrons, that is a negatively charged ion. So when we talk about net charge, what we're talking about is the excess charge. So in this case, we have excess negative charge. So if I'm talking about the charge of the object, I'm talking simply about the fact that there's one extra electron. If I remove these two electrons, and I have a positive ion, I'm talking about the lack of negative charge. So we either talk about electrons or talk about electron holes, which are what we call positive charge. So it's the fact that the nucleus isn't completely balanced out. So anytime I'm talking about charge in this course, I'm talking about net charge, not total charge. How much excess positive is there due to a lack of electrons? How much extra negative there is due to extra electrons? And keep in mind that while an electron is, to our knowledge at this point in time, as small as you can break up an electron, both protons and neutrons are made up of what are called quarks. And quarks have positive or partial charges, so you can't actually find a quark by itself in nature because charge is what we call quantized. So as I just said, charge is quantized. So this means that in nature, charge is multiples of 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs, where coulomb is going to be our unit for charge. So an electron is negative 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs, and a proton is a positive 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. That is what we call the fundamental charge. And this is what we will be exploring in lab this week. The idea that charge is quantized or that there is a smallest amount of charge you can find naturally in nature. So quarks, which make up protons and neutrons, the quarks come together, some of them have two-thirds charge, some have one-third, some are positive, some are negative, and they come together so that you have a charge of plus one or 1 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs for a proton, and you have a charge of nothing for a neutron. So protons and neutrons are made up of a specific uh, set of quarks so that their charges come out correct. Charge is also conserved. 
And this should make sense for mechanics because you learn in mechanics that mass is conserved. Mass just doesn't magically disappear. Well, because a charge comes from a physical object, whether it's an object with excess electrons or with electrons missing, so it has a specific charge to it or net charge to it, charge comes from a physical object, and since that physical object can't just disappear, neither can the charge. So charge is conserved. And this is going to have a consequence throughout the semester, especially when we start talking about things in circuits like current, where that, ch that charge has to go somewhere, and that's going to dictate how that circuit behaves. All right, so let's talk about some more vocabulary words. We're going to be working a lot with conductors and insulators. So conductors easily allow the movement of charge through them. And typically these tend to be uh, larger or heavier metals uh, because if you think back of the simulation I just showed you of the structure of the atom, the more electrons you have piled on top of the nucleus of the atom, the less those outer electrons can be held onto. So this is why metals tend to be good conductors because they have those loose electrons on the outside that can flow from one atom that makes that the material to another. So it allows a net current or a net flow of charge. Insulators, on the other hand, do not allow the easy movement of charge through them. So these materials are going to have a way of better holding onto their electrons so that they don't get pushed from one atom to the next and actually flow through the object. All right, so let's talk about how things get charged. The first one is conduction. And when we charge something through conduction, it involves actually just touching. And the electrons flow from one object to the next. The more interesting one is induction. And with induction, you don't actually have the two objects that are sort of involved in the charge transfer process touch each other. With induction, you start out with a neutral object. And then you have the neutral object and you have another charged object nearby. And this causes what's called charge separation where because this is negative here, so that's why I've drawn the little minus sign that's negative, we should know from working with magnets, north and south pole, the north attracts south, and the two north ends would repel each other. Well, charge works the same way. We're going to find that magnetism and electricity have some sort of symmetry to them in some ways and not in others. But one of the idea that like repels like, same attracts, holds true. So that means that all the negative charge in this object is going to get pushed to the other side, leaving the other side without electrons so that it has a net positive charge. So we have what's called charge separation. Negative gets pushed to one side, leaving electron holes or positive charge on the other side. Well, I will say it does, you do have to touch the object to something, and you do have to ground it so that the electrons can flow out. So the negative electrons, or negative electrons are going to flow to the ground and out of the object. This is still negatively charged over here. So you're going to be left with just this positive charge over here. The electrons have flown out the ground. And then once you remove that negatively charged object, the charge is going to evenly spread out and you're going to have now a net positive charge on the object. So you can charge something through conduction, which is touching, or induction, which is, involves charge separation, and then allowing the excess charge to flow into out of ground. There's one more that I want to show you. All right, so what I want to talk about here is polarization. Now, right now we have a simulation where everything is neutrally charged. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to rub this balloon 
on the wool sweater. So notice that the balloon, because I'm touching, so we're getting charged through conduction, is picking up all those excess electrons. And then I'm going to move the balloon over by the wall. So notice what we get here is charge separation. First, because the balloon is negatively charged, the negative charge of the wall is being pushed away so the only positive charge is near the balloon. So this is what charge separation, similar to the idea of what we saw with the induction. Well, with polarization, we get a little bit more specific, where you're going to have something that is negatively charged. And you might have a molecule, like a water molecule. So we have our electrons here, so this end is going to be negatively charged. And then we have our hydrogen over here, so this end is going to be positively charged. So in the presence of this, this is actually going to flip over so that our negative end is over here and our positive end is over here. So all the molecules would orientate themselves so that this negatively charged object, the negative end is pointing away and the positive end is pointing towards the negative charge. And it creates what's called polarization. And you can think of the word polarizing as something, it's like a topic that is putting people on one side or the other. So if all the water molecules making up a fluid all orientate themselves a specific way, one end of the fluid is going to have a negative charge and the other end is going to have a positive charge. So you sort of induce charge through polarization. So this, this end over here is going to act like a negative end, this is going to act like a positive end. And this is going to play a role later on when we talk about capacitors later because this is going to end up being how dielectrics work.